Hello, I am the Nerdy Apologist, and on this channel we use the tools of faith and reason to come to a knowledge of the truth. This video is part of a series I am doing on Christian apologetics, so if you have not seen the previous videos, please check them out before continuing with this one. Thus far, we have established that God exists, that Jesus existed, and that the Gospels are authentic. That is, they were actually written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The authenticity of the Gospels is the first step in proving that they are reliable. The next step is to show that the text of the Gospels, as well as the rest of the New Testament, was transmitted accurately over the centuries. Now, it should be noted that this video will not be dealing with whether or not the content of the New Testament is true. This video will only be refuting the claim that we cannot know what the New Testament originally said. Skeptics who make this claim like to plant seeds of doubt in the minds of Christians by saying that we don't have the original manuscripts. All we have are copies of copies of copies, so how do we know that the text of the New Testament wasn't corrupted over time, and that the text of our current Bibles doesn't say anything different from what it originally said? After all, haven't you played the game of telephone, where the message you hear at the end is completely different than what was originally said? Now, it is true that we don't have any of the original manuscripts of the New Testament, but this is no cause for alarm. First of all, the game of telephone is a horrible analogy for the textual transmission of the New Testament. For one thing, the game of telephone is about oral transmission rather than textual transmission, so the whole comparison is one between apples and oranges. Also, the game of telephone has rules that artificially amplify the errors in the transmission. The message is only transmitted one person at a time, is whispered in a hushed tone, and each person can only hear it once before transmitting it. It doesn't even accurately represent the oral transmission of the gospel in the first century, let alone the textual transmission of the New Testament. Next of all, when we compare the manuscripts of the New Testament to other works of antiquity, there's simply no competition in terms of how accurate they are. When looking at the manuscripts for a document, there are two criteria that have to be kept in mind, the number of manuscripts and the age of those manuscripts. The more manuscripts we have, the better, because that means we can more easily trace the transmission. It's also better if the manuscripts are spread out over a wide geographic region. The older the manuscripts are, the better, because that means they are closer to the original source. For the New Testament, we have about 5,800 manuscripts in Greek. The oldest of these is a fragment from the Gospel of John and has been dated to around the year 130 AD, around 40 years from the original. In fact, this single manuscript completely debunked the idea that the Gospel of John was written in the late 2nd century. We also have about a hundred other papyrus fragments from the second century, from which most of the New Testament can be reconstructed. Some of our earliest manuscripts that contain complete New Testament books are codices Alexandrinus, Vaticanus, and Sinaiticus, which date to the 4th and 5th centuries. Compare this with the Iliad, which has the second most number of Greek manuscripts of any ancient text, around 650. The earliest of these dates to around the 2nd century, about a thousand years after the original, and yet scholars agree that these manuscripts accurately reflect the original story of the Iliad, even if there are some variations. When we start looking at other works from antiquity, the manuscript evidence becomes even more scarce. For example, let's look at Josephus and Tacitus. The earliest manuscript of Josephus's Jewish war comes from the 4th century, and it's in Latin, not Greek. The earliest Greek manuscript we have comes from the 10th century, about 900 years after the original. In total, we have nine Greek manuscripts. For Tacitus's Annals, we have two Greek fragments that date to the 9th and 11th centuries, 700 and 900 years after the original, respectively. Furthermore, these manuscripts do not overlap and don't represent the entire document. Yet historians will gladly accept what is written in these two documents as reflecting the original. The simple fact is, if you're going to be hyper-skeptical of the New Testament, you're going to have to be even more skeptical of every other ancient document. Now at this point, someone might say, yes, but that doesn't mean that what's written in these documents is true or that these documents are inspired. Recall what I said at the beginning of the video. We are only discussing the accuracy of the transmission, not whether these documents are inerrant or inspired. However, a lot of skeptics point to the large number of textual variants, differences among the manuscripts, as a reason to doubt the textual accuracy of the New Testament. It has been estimated that there are about 200,000 textual variants in the New Testament, which is more variants than words. This may sound shocking, but let's put this into perspective. Look at these sentences. 
No two of these sentences are alike, yet we can all agree that these sentences basically say the exact same thing. This is similar to what most of the variants in the Greek New Testament are like. You see, in English, word order is more or less fixed. However, in Greek, word order for the most part doesn't affect the meaning of the sentence. Most of the New Testament variants are either spelling errors or words in a different order. 99.8% of the variants aren't even translatable. Of the variants that are translatable, many of them are not viable, meaning that we can determine that they were not part of the original text, because they were either too late or appear or only in one geographic region. Of the viable textual variants, all of them, yes, that's right, every single one of them is inconsequential. In fact, if you have a modern Bible translation, you can see most of these variants in the footnotes. Here's how inconsequential these are. In Luke 5.39, Jesus says, quote, And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. Unquote. There's a footnote in my Bible that says, Other ancient authorities read better, as opposed to good. We may not know whether Jesus said the old is good or the old is better, but does it really matter? I doubt any Christian is going to lose sleep over which variant reading is the correct one. For another example, in John 10.35, Jesus asks the Pharisees, quote, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Unquote. But some manuscripts read Son of God instead. Again, it's utterly inconsequential. In fact, not a single Christian doctrine is affected by these textual variants. Not even one. Now, it's important to understand what I mean by that. There are some specific passages where a doctrine is present in one variant but absent in another. However, when we take a look at the entire New Testament as a whole, major doctrines are not affected. Here are some examples of what I mean. Let's look at 1 Timothy 3.16. In the King James Version, this verse reads, quote, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory." Unquote. The part that says God was manifest in the flesh is a clear reference to the Incarnation, or to the doctrine that says God became man in the person of Christ Jesus. However, if we look at this verse in the Revised Standard Version, we read, quote, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of our religion, he was manifested in the flesh, etc. In this variant reading, the clear reference to the Incarnation is absent. However, there are plenty of other verses, like John 1.1, 1, 1, that can be used to support the deity of Christ. Also, the difference between these two readings is only one letter in the Greek text, so it's easy to see why a later scribe would have mistook one reading for the other. Another famous example is 1 John 5.7, which, depending on the variants, either contains a clear reference to the Trinity or does not. Yet again, there are other verses that can be used to support the Trinity that are not affected by textual variants. Now, skeptics do like to point to a number of passages that are supposedly significantly altered by textual variants. Most of these only differ by a word or two and pose no more of an issue than the verses I've already mentioned. I will focus on the two most significant textual variants, though. These are the longer ending of Mark and the Pericope de Adultera, or the story of the woman caught in adultery in John. These passages are both 12 verses long and are not present in our earliest manuscripts. Most Christian scholars are happy to accept these passages as inauthentic, though I've posted some links in the description to both sides of the argument if you want to research this more. It should be noted again that even though these variants are long, they still do not threaten any major doctrine. However, skeptics also like to point out that these passages are evidence of major editing done by the early Christians to the Gospels. After all, couldn't there be other major edits that we don't know about? First of all, if we accept these passages as inauthentic, we can also determine the reasons why these edits were made. In the case of the longer ending of Mark, it's that Mark's original ending was lost, so a new ending was written based mostly on information that we can find elsewhere in the New Testament. In the case of the Pericope de Adultera, this was likely an event that really did happen as part of Jesus' ministry, and was part of the oral tradition of the apostles, and thus was added in because it was a popular story. These are special cases and do not cast doubt on the reliability of the text. Second of all, if there had been other major edits made to the text, given the number of early manuscripts we have, not only in Greek, but in other languages as well, and all of the church father quotations that we have, we would likely have found other major differences among the manuscripts. 
but we don't. Again, these passages are special cases. So, in the end, textual variants do not cast doubt on the textual reliability of the New Testament, and we can know what the New Testament originally said with a greater confidence than any other ancient text. That's all for this video. Thank you all for watching. I hope to see you all again, and God bless.